Hi everyone, and welcome to an episode that isn't really retro related, except it is, kind of. You see, I've just had this little package delivered to me, and it contains a project I've wanted to take a look at for a very long time, but couldn't really find any reason for it other than curiosity and fun. Well, I've decided that curiosity and fun are in fact reason enough to do it, so let's have some fun with the RC2014 Mini. So the RC2014 project has been around since, well, since 2014, and is the brainchild of Spencer Owen, who way back in the mists of time, well, 2013 to be exact, decided to build a replica of a ZX80, despite never having done anything like that before. And this led him to the website of Grant Searle, who had posted the designs for an exact replica, and it's a wonderful resource. So please go take a look, there's a link in the description. Tinkering with this design through 2013 allowed Spencer to really get to know the fundamentals of Z80 computing, and when he heard about the 2014 Retro Challenge, there followed an exercise in learning Z80 machine language and an entry to the competition using a home-built Z80 machine, which was called RC2014, Retro Challenge 2014. Anyway, spin forward a few years and the project has grown immensely with all manner of add-ons and extra functionality and three distinct versions, the Classic 2, the Mini and the Micro, and they differ mainly in the amount of expansion capabilities they have. I've decided to take the middle ground as my first foray into the world of the RC2014. It's a build that should take about an hour or so and we can then take a look at what it can do and of course what it can't. So while the build is going on in the background, let's talk about what it actually is. Well, simply put, it's a single board build which combines all of the essential elements that you would find in a computer, the CPU, RAM, ROM and I.O including serial access to connect to it using a terminal emulator. Or if that sounds like a bit of a hassle, the Mini also has the capability to add a Raspberry Pi Zero and then use that for HDMI out to a monitor and to attach and use a standard USB keyboard. The CPU is a Z80 which is clocked at 7.3728 MHz coupled with 32K of RAM and an 8K ROM containing Microsoft Basic, and Serial I.O. runs at a nice 115,000 board. The board itself is designed to be able to plug into 5 or 8 bay backplanes from the same manufacturer, and that then allows for further modules to be plugged in and made available. There are tons of modules available for the RC2014 series, but not all will work with the Mini. Some need the full 2014 kit, which is much more modular in design and allows you to swap out individual components, such as the memory, if you fancy an upgrade to 512K, Wi-Fi, joysticks, IDE hard disk, the list goes on. And for this Mini, there are a good number of fun things to plug in too. One such addition, which I'm seriously toying with for absolutely no particular reason, is the CPM upgrade kit, which turns this machine into a fully fledged CPM powerhouse, which with 64K of memory, a much faster processor and compact flash storage, actually outperforms a research machine's 380Z, which many of you will remember from your school days, and which way back in 1980 would have set you back an incredible 3,266 pounds for the top end 64K version with dual discs. That's 12,752 pounds in today money. Now, I'm not sure why I want a CPM machine or what I'd ever do with it, but part of me just loves the idea that I could do something with it. Perhaps you guys can inspire me in the comments. Throughout the build, there were only a couple of things that required me to double check the guide. One of those was the depiction of the resistors. The colours weren't a good match, but I checked each one with a multimeter before fitting just to make sure. And the other thing was the suggestion to permanently bridge links on the PCB. I chose not to, but to fit headers and jumpers instead, just in case I needed to undo it at some point in the future. Probably never will, but I've been caught out before. I did the same thing on my BBC Micro when bridging the link to make the composite output colour. Can't think of why I'd ever want to put it back to black and white, but with a jumper in place, I can. All of these headers being fitted certainly give the impression that this thing is pretty configurable and can interface with a lot of stuff. And in the main, that's true in all but one key area, which if you haven't noticed yet, we'll certainly talk about later. 
I've got to say that from looking at the number of combinations of base models and add-on modules available, joining the community beforehand and asking as many questions as you can would be a good start to your journey. It could avoid you buying the wrong things or even just avoid wasting a lot of time figuring things out. We're nearing the end of the build here and so far the total time is one hour and 10 minutes. So really not that long at all and testimony to the quality of the instructions and the packaging of the kit. Everything nicely labeled and bagged. And as we finally pop in all the ICs, we can give the whole thing a nice visual inspection and then it's time to plug it all in and see if it works. For this test, I'm setting the Serial Stroke Pi jumper to Serial. This means that we'll be controlling the RC2014 via the Serial interface rather than the Pi's USB keyboard input. We'll also enable the FTDI power jumper, meaning that the 5 volt power to the board will come from the USB through the FTDI module rather than through the separate 5 volt power socket. Finally, we'll plug the HDMI cable in with the other end into my capture card. I've got OBS set up to capture two windows, the capture from the RC2014 and the window of my terminal emulator. OK, let's plug the FTDI cable in to power up the RC2014. And we have life. Now, at this point, I must admit to not having read the documentation and struggled here for a while. After all, the screen says that it's waiting for a serial connection, but try as I might, I couldn't get TerraTerm, Putty or anything to connect to it. It was only when I pressed the reset switch on the side of the unit that the screen cleared, TerraTerm connected and I had control. Pressing enter at the memory top prompt tells the machine that you want access to the whole 32K memory and we're in. You know, I have to start with the usual, I just can't help it. And while this is running, I'd like to mention that it was right about now that I got my first sense of disappointment. It had nagged at me throughout the build that I hadn't seen any form of an SD card connection for file storage. I would presumed there would be, and that's on me of course. I then looked at the CPM upgrade, which has a compact flash card built in, but that's only for use with CPM. It's not accessible from basic. In fact, there are currently no true SD card save and load functions available from within BASIC and this does in my mind limit the usefulness of the machine. There are SD card solutions in the works but there's nothing as elegant as you'd find in for example the Color Maximite, the BASIC engine or the CB2 micro kit. Using TerraTerm we're selecting COM9 as that's the virtual COM port that Windows has assigned to the FDDI USB to serial interface. We need to change the board rate to 115,200 and we'll set the flow control to RTS CTS. And we'll also add in a three millisecond delay between each character and each line so that we don't overload the flow control when we're copying large amounts of text, which we'll need to do to copy and paste programs to the machine. Let's take a look at this Mandelbro fractal program as it's a good demonstration of the machine and also shows off the color output. I've enjoyed building this and if I do get inspired to do the CPM upgrade, I'll post that video up too. And in the meantime, I've got to say a massive thanks to Spencer at RC2014 as he's not only given me a few hours of fun so far with this, he's also given me an RC2014 micro kit to give away to one of you lucky folks out there in interwebland. There are no long rules and regulations attached to this, but what there is, is contained in the description. And all you really need to know is this. If you fancy a chance at getting hold of this, leave a comment with the hashtag hash RC2014 somewhere in it. You've got until 10 p.m. GMT on Monday the 3rd of May 2021 to leave your hashy tag and Mrs. RetroShack will be randomly picking a winner on Tuesday the 4th of May. The winner will be announced in a post on the community tab on the channel homepage. Good luck to you all, I'm off to have some fun with this little machine. As usual, if you like the video, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of new content. If you'd like to help support the channel, please hit the join button for details of how you can. Irrespective of hashy tags, please leave your comments below as we always love to read them. And until next time in the shack, goodbye and good luck.